Hi, everybody. I hope everyone uh, is doing well out there. I am Ari Ingle, the Director of Creative Community for Peace. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have people tuning in literally once again from all over the world. These panel sessions are absolutely amazing and uh, it shows the power of technology to connect us all. For those of you uh, who don't know, Creative Community for Peace is a nonprofit entertainment industry organization comprised of prominent members of the entertainment community who have come together to promote the arts as a bridge to peace. Additionally, we are the leading organization working to counter anti-Semitism within the entertainment industry, in addition to countering the cultural boycott of Israel. Through the years, we provided guidance and support to artists such as Alicia Keys, Rihanna, Bon Jovi, and literally hundreds of others. To learn more about our work and to support our work as we are a nonprofit, please visit ccfpeace.com. Once again, that's ccfpeace.com or Creative Community for Peace. Dot com. I want to thank Liz and Avi Kaner, along with Morton Williams Supermarkets, for sponsoring today's panel. Uh, we give a big shout out to them, and uh, we can't do it without support of theirs and, and others like them. Uh, I'm really pumped for today's panel, more than any other panel we've had, uh, because not often you get to talk to legends to discuss music and the arts bringing people together in Israel, which is a core to our mission. Uh, for those of us joining us on Zoom, you can leave questions in the Q&A section and we'll get to as many as possible, but we do have a phenomenal performance today, so I'm not sure how many we will be able to get to. Uh, unfortunately, a little bit of bad news. The legendary Mira Awad is unable to join us. She came down with something today. She's not feeling well, uh, so we wish her well. We're sending her positive vibes that she gets well very soon and everything is okay. Uh, to briefly introduce our guests, uh, this first guest, before his name, uh, when I was studying in Israel and lived there for a year, someone handed me a CD uh, with this guy playing the Spanish guitar in it, and it was called Live from Masada. And I thought, what is this? I listen to hip hop music. You know, what's this going to be about? And I literally ended up playing that CD the whole year, almost every single day. So he has toured the world over. He has shared the stage with everyone from Bob Dylan and Paul Simon. He's easily regarded as one of the greatest Spanish guitar players alive today. I am pumped to welcome the legendary Israeli artist, David Broda Rosa to the panel. Uh, our, next guest uh, our next guest is one of the most acclaimed singer songwriters of his generation. Uh, over the course of his career, he has recorded 20 studio albums, won multiple Grammy awards, has had his songs recorded by artists such as Johnny Cash, Waylon Jennings, Joan Baez, Emily Harris and The Pretenders. He's also an actor, a producer, and a playwright. The legendary Steve Earle is with us today. I'm telling you guys, we literally have legends. Uh, you don't get these kind of people on panels uh, anywhere else. Uh, our next guest has been named to Forbes 30 Under 30 list. He is the founder and director of the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, which brings together Jews and Palestinian youth to sing and to talk and connect with one each other. We are honored to have Micah Hendler with us today. Last but certainly not least is a Grammy award-winning producer, an entrepreneur, an author, or a tech innovator, the former president of Columbia Records and the founder of S-Curve Records, who has signed and produced for artists such as Joss Stone, Hanson, Andy Grammer, the Jonas Brothers, in addition to having a passion and love for Israel and the music community there, and for also writing and producing Who Let Them Dogs Out, the legendary music executive and CCFP advisory board member, Steen Greenberg, is with us today. Hi, Steve. Finally, our moderator is the features editor of Variety, Melina Saval, is leading the discussion today. And with that, I turn it over to you, Melina. Hi. Um, OK, I'm just working with my mic here. Hi everyone, this is such a treat. I'm, I'm a huge fan of all of yours and um, I feel a little bit starstruck, I'll admit, because you're all wonderful and I really kind of fell in love with the work that you're doing, especially through the documentary East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. I really got um, a chance to know who you are and really get a sense of your passion for the work that you're doing. So I wanted to, and, and Steve Greenberg and I, you know, I was thinking last year at this time, we were in Eurovision. We were in Israel together in Tel Aviv. Yes, so, we were. It was, it was amazing to be at Eurovision in Tel Aviv. And uh, it's, uh, the world has changed a lot in the past year. 
The world has changed a lot. So I think I, I'd like to start out with um, a question for, for David, and um, who, of whom I am such a big fan and admire you so much for your artistic work and your, human, your humanitarian work too. You mentioned something in the documentary where you say, I'm not a political artist. I, I don't you know, approach things from a political realm, but, sometimes, but you get pulled in to this political realm a lot because of who you are and the work that you're doing. How can we make peace an apolitical um, goal and mission through music? How can we make it apolitical? How can art come to, you know, make the the mission and, and striving for peace not political? Great. Well, that's a very good question. And I, it, I can try to make it short, the answer, and maybe concise. So uh, coming in from the Middle East, everything is politics. Everything from the, from the parsley that you buy in the market, ask yourself where it was grown, probably in the West Bank or in Gaza even. You, you wouldn't even know. Um, down to driving a, a little, taking a little ride with a taxi driver who will tell you exactly how you're on the wrong side of politics because he's looking in the rear view mirror and he recognizes me. So everything is politics. But when you are actually being a, um, an activist in the sense of uh, the way I'm doing things, I'm interested in the grassroots and the way to interfere or perhaps to change the course of politics, if that may be the, the way to do it, is to recondition people and to educate them, to educate them to respect the other. The problem that we're losing constantly from day one, from the creation of Israel, is that we were so concerned, and have been concerned for seven years and over seven years in creating this country, creating a, na a national uh, uh, identity, an educational identity, everything that comes with creating a country, that we have kind of let the, the side of respecting the other, understanding that there are other people, and it happens here in the States too. Don't forget the Native Americans that have been completely shunned and put aside while there's a great nation coming together uh, of, of the United States of America. So Israel is not doing, inventing any new way of inventing itself. However, there's got to be a path and a course that will educate and will steer education for the youth to grow in a natural way to understand that the Palestinian, the Arab, the Muslim, the Christian, the Jew, we're different people, we're all alike. And you have to educate. You must. That's the ABC of any society. And this is where I put all my energy, all my energy from the day that I remember myself. And it comes from my family. And so this is my answer to you. Music, to, to me, a supreme way of, uh, and a tool of, of handing down that message but after all, at the end of the day, it comes to the teachers and to instilling it in the, in the educational course. And, um, and this, this is the only thing I can say is of any valid, maybe uh, worthy uh, opinion of mine. I think this would be a great time. I want to, um, I don't know how many people listening have seen the documentary East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. I don't know how many people have listened to the album. But Matt, I think this would be a great time to run this clip because I think a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is covered in this amazing documentary that came out in 2013. So if we could run the clip and then I can ask some more questions. Is Matt, Matt, are you gonna run the clip? I just wanna make sure. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> and while I guess while we're getting it up and running, uh, this are people seeing it? Yeah. Okay, great. But we can't hear anything. Okay. Well, we can just tell them to go to watch it on Amazon on one of the other. Yeah, you, I go, exactly. Go go watch it on Amazon. Um, but um, the the movie came out. The documentary came out in two thousand and it was filmed in two thousand and thirteen. Yep. And in the um, in the documentary, it's about the making of your album East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, which you recorded for eight days, eight nights in Sabrine Studios. Um, in East Correct. Jerusalem. 
And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you why it was so important to you to create this, this, this album, this record in East Jerusalem specifically. All right. Well, it was nothing, it, it wasn't um, a sudden decision or, or a little uh, gimmicky decision. I've been in, uh, I've been recording and spending much time in Sabrine Studios in East Jerusalem since 1999. So, th and this is already 2013 when we're recording. So you can, you know, it's been 14 years. Uh, it has become my second home or my third home or my first home, depending on which day you call me. And um, it's, it was an, an imperative for me to integrate my music and create my music in the environment that I feel most happy in and uh, ground, doing groundbreaking things from an emotional standpoint. And also maybe, maybe after all, uh, sending out a message that the other, let's say from an Israeli standpoint, which is the Palestinian, is exa not exactly just another, it's just one like us. And that it should be a very natural, um, uh, let's say a, a habit almost, or a natural process to, uh, to try to include uh, in, in my music and in any production and any art form or in any discussion, uh, a Palestinian, if he's part of your conversation. If he's a musician, then right. work with Palestinian musicians. If he's a dancer, do it with dancers. If he's a psychologist, do it with Palestinian psychologists. And there's a lot of that going around, especially in the last five years, it's grown, not because of the film, uh, but just because of the nature of the evolutionary process that Israel and Palestine are going through. Um, you know, the, the greatest thing for me was to watch Steve Earle, who came in almost baptized into the, into the conflict from, from that point of view, because he's a very scholarly, knowledgeable, opinionated human being. And I, res I respect him tremendously for that, and even more so for his songwriting and performance. Yeah. But to watch him walk through the doors of the studio, and then eight days later walk out of those doors, somewhat, I don't think a changed man, but a man with a different point of view uh, about conflict resolution, which can pertain also to issues in Texas or in LA or anywhere in the world for that matter. But we, you know, this was basically uh, open wounds and trying to heal them without throwing salt on them, you know, so they don't hurt so much. Steve was a very, very big uh, catalyst there. As, as Steve Greenberg, of course, to me was a mentor, but Steve Earl was the one who really, really found himself in, in that lion's den, you know? Uh, you could ask him how, how he thinks that if it's a, even a, a valid point of view, what we're talking about. Yes, yeah, Steve, I mean, I was so f fast. I mean, I, your, your work is just immeasurable. And, you know, you, you wrote the album Jerusalem um, before you'd ever been to Jerusalem, correct? Right. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, so, David Rosemann, so a man of me. <clears throat> right. So it's just, it's so fascinating to me. You created this whole, this body of work called Jerusalem. And then about 10 years later, you actually got to visit Jerusalem. How were your expectations met? How were they challenged when you finally got there and saw the actual city for yourself? Well, you know, it's not a place that, that's on my normal itinerary. It's not a place that I've ever gone touring. You know, I toured most of Western Europe and never been to the Mideast at all. Um, and I, you know, David and I met because we had both made records of Towns Van Zandt songs at the same time. And we had, to, you know, we knew of each other and, and because we both, have, you know, get, we both get called political songwriters and, and we're not, I, I still write more songs about girls than I do anything else, but you know, I'm a, I'm a person that's political. So, so I'm not afraid to write songs that are about issues. I just was raised that way. It's just when I came up and when I learned how to do what I do. But David just threw this idea out there that he had been talking about for a long time, which was the idea of, you know, this this record in East Jerusalem in Sabine with, you know, with with Israeli and Arab, you know, musicians from all over the region. And um, I'm not afraid of Roger Waters. So I, I basically, I couldn't turn it down. And uh, it was my first yeah. trip. And as you see me arriving in the country in the film, and it's it's pretty funny because I, I, my, my perspective of Israel is arriving in Tel Aviv, getting into a van, David met me at the airport, and I went straight to East Jerusalem, and, you know, straight to the ambassador, and then walked down the street to the studio, and we started making this record. So, 
that's my perspective. And, and, um, and, you know, I went back uh, to do, um, to do um, the sunrise concert with David, you know, um, a little while after that. And, and uh, it was, it was a huge, it was a life changing experience. I don't think, um, I don't think, I think I understood the political situation better than some people do, but seeing it firsthand, it is completely different. And the things that I learned that, you know, that there were areas that were essentially refugee camps within the city limits of Jerusalem that, yeah. that have existed since 1967. That, you know, just to actually, I got to see a good bit of the country because what I did was, you know, my days and nights were turned around. So um, I traveled around and saw a lot of Israel in the mornings before everybody else woke up and went to the studio and went to work and they would work late into the night. And then there was a big meal every evening. And um, it was... Um, it's kind of become, I can't wait to go back. I've been looking forward to going back uh, ever since the last trip there. I know, you know, your time with us is limited and I really wanted to ask you, talk about how you became a peacenik because you grew up in a country at war in the United States during the Vietnam era. I'm, you know, I'm assuming right. that's what you were referencing. Yeah. How did growing up a person of that time, a young person of that time influence your desire to create peace through the arts? It was, you know, it, that's where I, I, I sort of, um, one of the first things I ever did for more than a handful of people was I, I played in coffee houses because I couldn't play bars. I was too young. And because uh, I was 14, 15 years old when I started going out and playing and the Vietnam War is going on. And I live in San Antonio, Texas, which had, you know, four Air Force bases plus Fort yeah. Sam Houston. And um, one of the gigs I did was a coffee house that the GIs had created at Service Club 2 on Fort Sam Houston. So I met some of the guys that started Vietnam Veterans Against the War, which really began in Austin, Texas, uh, uh, at an airbase outside of Killeen, Texas, north of Austin, is mm -hmm. where Vietnam Vets Against the War began. And so I knew those guys, and, and um, they, um, you know, next thing I knew, I was standing on a flatbed truck in front of the Alamo singing, feel like I'm fixing to die rag. And, it ended up on the news and my dad, who was an air traffic controller, worked for the government, got called in front of his boss. But so from that point on, I just never, from the time I started playing, it was, I, I always believed that music was a way to communicate things that, that you can't necessarily do just by, by talking or by carrying a sign. Music, um, it's, it, you, can, you can get away with singing things that you can't get away with saying sometimes. I want to ask you a question, Steve Earle, and then I would love to also hear the answers from David and Steve Greenberg. Um, you had mentioned Mother, the Pink Floyd song, Roger Waters, winds up on this album. We all know Roger Waters is a huge proponent of BDS, wants to boycott Israel, and yet this song that he, that he wrote that Pink Floyd made famous appears on the album. And I love, I actually love the irony of that. It's really turning it on its head. Um, tell me a little bit about the choice to include that song um that wasn't and, irony that was david rosa <laughs> that's so, um you know so it, it, the way you make pieces like i mean I, I i can sound a little antagonistic and i've bumped into to roger a few times since and you know i understand why 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 people try to take that stance but most they're they're near by and large people because of the boycott that haven't actually been to israel and um don't understand that there are you know Zionist peaceniks, that those two things aren't, you know, those two terms don't contradict each other. And, um, you know, the, the idea that the term Zionist has become a negative, has a negative connotation when, when you're discussing, you know, this issue, in a, and not just in Israel, in a lot of the world. And uh, um, it never made sense to me, but I saw it firsthand, and I came away with a lot of stuff. I saw it in a way that you could probably... Um, I saw it with David Broza and, and uh, it's the people that he knows, he, the, the, he's known all of his life there. They're, I, met, I met people on the Palestinian side. I met people, I stayed in the hotel where, where you know, David got, David got married there. You know, it's the, his part of his life is in that part, that part of that country. And I just, uh, to me, um, it's it's something you almost have to see firsthand because we get it filtered through a lot of other stuff. You know, our view right. of Israel is 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 not particularly accurate because of the lens that we see it through in a lot of the rest of the world. 
Right. And as, and as, as far as you know, the, the Roger Waters thing, actually, I, I want to kind of take a lead from David Broza on this. You know, David has for years told me that he um, doesn't believe in boycotts in general. You know, and yeah. he'll play a concert anywhere know, yeah. as long as long as he's able to sing whatever he wants to sing and convey whatever message he wants to convey. He thinks it's important to bring a message to people who you may not agree with. Uh, and to shut off that communication is only counterproductive. So on a certain level, I think that it, the Mother being on the record, um, and there's a lot of reasons I think that David chose Mother for the record, but I think it does also, it, it does in addition to everything else really say that, you know, even a person who doesn't approve of the existence of this project, because it, it meant that people were working in Israel, um, has music that's worth hearing, and then we don't want to shut his voice out either, his artistic voice right. out either. I think it's a beautiful message. Well, and also peace, love, and understanding. Elvis Costello's song um, appears. It's all about peace, love, and understanding, but here's another person who's been very vocal about supporting BDS. Um, was that a conscious choice? And, and Micah too, I mean, Micah, you know, the kids come in from the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, you know, they're, they're coming in too, singing the song. Um, did it ever come up? Yes, this was a song made popular by a person who doesn't really necessarily think you should be here together doing this. Okay, and I just, well, not only that, you know, the album also has a version of Every Day I Write the Book on it, which right. was written by Elvis Costello. Peace, Love, and Understanding yeah. was actually written by Nick Lowe, although it was popular. Right, right, that's true, yes. Um, so, you know, I wanted to talk to Steve. You have a very interesting background. Um, you were um, a DJ um, a million years ago uh, for, um, uh, sorry, I don't know, the Peace Radio. Um, yeah, the Voice of Peace. And, yeah, Voice of Peace. Voice of Peace, you were on a boat. Um, you had to live on this, this boat traveling around. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience and how that kind of led you to, you know, making peace through the arts one of your missions as well. The, the voice of peace was the fulfillment of the vision of a very special Israeli um, named A.B. Natan, who had this idea, again, not so dissimilar from David, that, that said, like, if we can communicate with each other, you know, it's going to be a lot harder to, to hate each other. If we're all listening to the same music, if we're all enjoying the same thing together, um, it, it builds some bridges. And he actually got um, John Lennon to donate the money to buy the right. ship uh, that the peace ship, uh, the, the Voice of Peace broadcast from. And he broadcast for many years. He broadcast from about 1973 all the way till about 1996 or so um, in the name of peace through communication, peace through, under, you know, peace through understanding. Um, what's, uh, he was such a wonderful idealist, A.B. Natan, that he sunk the peace ship in 1996 after the Oslo Accords because he believed that peace had arrived and the ship was no longer needed. And so in a big symbolic gesture, he sank the ship saying, our work is completed. As, as we know, that proved to be over, overly optimistic. Um, but he was, he was a beautiful person. And for me, I, you know, I'd always heard the voice of peace when I was a very young person um, spending some time in Israel. And I desperately wanted to be a DJ there. And it was an incredible experience. Just, you know, again, you know, living there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and just broadcasting to everybody in the area who could pick up the station. Um, it, was, uh, it was an amazing thing that the crew of the ship and the, and the staff of the radio station came from all over the world and had all kinds of different political opinions. And, you know, again, when you get that close to people for that long, you really start to understand where people are coming from. I was so curious, is the ship still available? Like, do people scuba down there? I mean, like, where is the ship? <laughs> Is the it ship still accessible? Was sunk, sunk about 12 miles off the coast of Tel Aviv. And I don't know if anybody scoop is there, but it'd be pretty cool it's, if they did. And, I, and so, all I can say is I hope he took the records off the ship before he sank. And he had about 100,000 <laughs> yeah. record albums on the ship. It's, it's incredible. Do you have any of those record albums or does somebody have them? I hope so. I, I hope he saved them. I mean, it would be a shame if he sunk the ship with the albums. He had an amazing collection. He also he had great, he had great equipment. It was really a first class radio station. You could pick up the station in Lebanon and in, in Jordan and in Israel and parts of Egypt. It was, uh, it, was, it was very influential in its day. Also, in that period, when he first started the, the station, there actually was no true pop radio station uh, in Israel that played like Western pop. So he, he kind of brought a lot of that sensibility into Israel. Cool. Um, David, I wanted to talk to you about your, your relationship with Isa, who um, is sort of your filmmaking partner. Um, 
and he's, you know, Palestinian and you're obviously Jewish Israeli. And at the beginning of the documentary, you have this moment where he says, when I'm with you, there's not a part of me that's Palestinian over here. I'm just Isa. I'm just here with you. And you have a moment where you say, of course, absolutely. If you were from Spain, if you were from somewhere else, you would still be Isa. We would still be friends. It was a really beautiful moment. How did you guys meet and how did your relationship create a partnership kind of begin? Well, so we met in, back in 1999. I met with him and with his partner, best friend from childhood, but partner to the Sabrin band, which is the first uh, prominent Palestinian contemporary uh, band. And they own a, a studio in East Jerusalem. A mutual friend of ours introduced us. So we, we headed off right away over, over a good dinner in the, in the old city. Actually, I just spoke with him before getting on air with you here. And uh, of course, he sends his best wishes. Maybe he's watching. As Mira Awad, by the way, who's so yeah. sorry that she not be with us. Um, so we met, and uh, throughout the years, these 14 years that preceded to the filming of this project, um, we just hung out and we spent more time with each other maybe than with our other friends or with our families. And uh, when it came to doing this film, uh, I was thinking about, well, if we're doing the film, and obviously I'm coming from Tel Aviv and I'll be uh, obviously approaching my Israeli uh, counterparts and, and friends who know how to how to make a movie, I insisted on having some Palestinians also in the crew, uh, not, not for the statement so much as for the fact that we're working in East Jerusalem and we should probably have a, a mutual, you know, I'm not saying half and half, it's not a peace process. This is a professional project and we had um, uh, two or three engineers on the album who were Palestinian uh, ex and while well, I had uh, engineers coming from Tel Aviv to, to do other engineering, uh, my musicians were Israeli, some musicians were Palestinian or Arabs from different parts of the country. And Isa is, first of all, he's one of the most, uh, um, I'd say, professional and experienced uh, documentarists. He's a photojournalist for years and years and years. And uh, it seemed to me that, that he would, first of all, he's the, the nicest man on earth. And he's one of my best friends. Uh, I could spend the rest of my life with him. He's, uh, that's the kind of guy. And since he's such a great cinematographer, I thought, Let's make him, you know, the cinematographer. He'll direct the other guys. We had three cameras at, at every given hour. And he was amazing. He could get literally into the guitar, into the drums, into the plate you're eating without you noticing him being there. And yeah. yet tell the story from, from, as, as a participant. The thing that surprised me most, and tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, how often do you find a cameraman who wants to be in front of the camera? Right. I have barely found any cameraman, director of photography, or anybody who's willing to be the interviewee rather than the interviewer. You understand? And here he's, it, was his, it was his initiative. He says, why did you come to my house in East Jerusalem? He's in the old city overlooking, you know, the Holy Mount. And he says, let's sit there at any time you want, any day you want, and let's converse. Let's just have a conversation. That was the easiest thing for me. And when he talks about, I'm not Isa, and I say to him, well, I'm not David the Israeli, I'm proving another way of saying boycotts can never work. If yeah. we would boycott each other, when would we ever have this conversation? I don't, you know, this is exactly what I'm saying. It's not about agreeing with each other. Each other. It's about agreeing that we exist. We're opposite sides, but maybe we're not. In the case of Isa and myself, they can blame us for, you know, breaking the laws and breaking the barriers and walking against our brothers. But I think we're doing much more uh, a much more healthier approach and, and uh, drawing a, a better line for the future than those who are turning back to, on each other and will only meet on the battlefield. And, and I bless him. And, I, and there's many more like Isa than one would think. And this is why the peace process, which is on the, you know, on the official political route, is not as significant as what's going on in real day, day, day to day right. and uh, in, in the people to people um, meetings that we have and acquaintances and God knows what relationships are going on in the Middle East, you wouldn't believe it. You'd, you'd sleep a lot better if you knew it. Yeah, which, which brings me to Micah. I mean, it, so much of this, not to be corny, but it really does start with the children and the kids. And Micah, what you're doing, bringing kids together, Jewish kids, Arab kids together, Palestinian kids together, just to sing um, in a common language. You know, a lot of times they come together and at least in the documentary, they're, they're singing songs in English. Um, what 
actually, it'd be great. Why don't we start? Are we able to run the clip of of the the children in the chorus, Matt? Is that going to work or? I can while we're getting ready for the clip. I'll just give a brief introduction. To okay, the great. Um, and feel free to interrupt any time with our with our latest video. We just put out a video actually with which David and Mira and Achino, Mimi, Noah, and a number of other amazing artists are on of all of us singing a song home, each of us from our homes. And the idea of home really gets at what the chorus is about, which is this sense of how do we create shared space? How do we create a space where all of us can be included equally and all of us can be equally represented and own what the space represents? And how can we, um, how can we all really be a part of this um, so that it really isn't just about coming to your home or you coming to my home? but this is our home together. And, and what we do in the chorus is not just the uh, musical work, but it's also dialogue work. We do facilitated dialogue work, which is really critical and address the realities that people are living within and address the difficulties and the challenges of their day-to-day -day lives in a context where people can be real with each other yeah. Um, but also still come back to uh, creating something beautiful together because that's what they love. I'm just going to turn up volume for a moment. Okay. Let's sing, shall we? Here we go. Shall we? Yeah. This is Maria from my house in the old city. This is home from Beit Halina, Jerusalem. This is Akhina Nini. This is Mira Awa. I love you all. This is Joanna Jones from my home in Hollywood. It's Rami coming to you live from the French Hill. I'm excited to be connected with everyone across the globe. This is Craig Jessup from my home in Providence, Utah. I'm trying to use my voice to weapon the man's connection. This is Peter Bookshare. love. Hi, Hi, I'm Sarah Shuri. I'm Casey Brothers. And I'm so happy that this song, Home, that I got to record with the JYC, is bringing so many people together at this time. Hi, it's Alice. Hello from my home in Wahhabia. <laughs> You know, when I when I watch that, I mean, um, I, I just it's such a beautiful concept bringing all these people together, and it's so important. I was wondering, did you meet some of the kids that came in that were really resistant to this idea? Were they kind of skeptical that any real conversation could kind of result from this? Any sort of under mutual understanding? And did you watch those kids grow? And you know, maybe at the at the end of kind of the process or during the process come to you and say, you know what, now I believe that this can work. I believe that peace is possible because we're doing it right here in this microcosm. Well, so what's really interesting is that, you know, you have the musical side and you have the dialogue side in the, in the program. And most of the kids who come, come because they love to sing, right? Yeah. That's like a natural human thing that people do. Turns out around the world, everybody loves to sing. And the dialogue actually is uncomfortable dialogue is hard when you're actually being real with somebody who's been uh who's been taught you know something that is the polar opposite of everything that you believe you know that's hard to hear um but the critical thing is that within the musical community you can have those relationships grounded in those discussions um, which then enables us to weather periods of intensified violence right. or, differ or, or difficulties. So it was actually really interesting. Often the, the kids who, in the, who are complaining about dialogue the most are then the ones when there's a, a period of heightened violence who are the ones who then demand extra dialogue sessions so that we can talk about what's going on. Um, and so it's actually really been a, um, not just an educational process, but also an important conflict resolution mechanism within the group itself. Not just to talk about external things, but to talk about internal things as well. Right, right. And then, um, you know, another thing, David, uh, Muhammad, who was the young rapper that appears in the documentary and on the album, I was really moved by him. He, um, he grew up in the Shuafat refugee camp, which I don't think a lot of people know is within 
the was which is inside Jerusalem, um, the walls of Jerusalem. It was established in 1967, I believe. Um, and he's he's a rapper, and you know the way he was describing this refugee camp. I mean, I've I've been to Israel many times. I lived in Jerusalem. I've never been to Shuafat. I've seen signs. I've never been there. There are no trees there. Um, it's cement. It's polluted. Um, the kids don't really have access to a lot. If you need an ambulance uh, to go to a hospital, there, there's you can't call an ambulance. You have to get in a car, and someone has to drive you. It's, 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 it. From my perspective, it seems like an extremely depressing, horrifying existence for these kids. Um, and he came, and he's part of the album, and he, I think, just has a really beautiful message to spread about how music can make such a big difference in the life of of children there. It exposes them to art and creativity in a way that they haven't before. Talk a little bit about what you're doing there now and what you, you've done there to go there and expose these kids to the joy of music and how you've done workshops with them um, and, and improve their lives, you know, as much as you can. Well, it's, it's kind of a tragic story because the refugee camp itself actually starts in 1948. Those who were expelled from Ramle, from Lod area, Lida, uh, moved over out there and as, as an interim makeshift uh, refugee camp. In 1967, some of those who settled in the old city were sent out, and, uh, when Israel took over the old city, were sent out again on a temporary level and, and were uh, settled in the refugee camp. And in the last, I want to say 10 or 15 years, when, uh, when East Jerusalem was annexed and became part of the greater Israel, uh, the refugee camp was included in that. And this is when we get, I mean, I feel that we get exposed, I get exposed at least, to this reality because when it is in the hands of the Palestinian Authority or it's refugee camps in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, you think, you know, you have, you have some feelings towards the situation, but it doesn't touch you as much as a citizen of Israel, whether it may be a B-class or C-class citizen, as unfortunately they are, they are <coughs> uh, they're not getting the fair treatment. They don't have utilities. They don't have schooling like we have. They don't, as you say, they don't have ambulances. They don't have health care. It's sanitation. And yeah. we're not aware of that. Nobody's aware of it. The reason you're not aware, aware of it is secondary. The fact that Israelis are not is because it's a closed up. Now it's walled out. Yeah. And as, as Muhammad said, when he was a child, he could still go out and play out in the hills. But once the walls were built around it, nobody can get out. You can go in and out if you're, if you're part of the camp. You can go to work and come back. But when a camp that was built for 5,000 people has 80,000 people, it's inhumane and it's part of Israel. This is where I, as a, an activist, a social activist, I come up and I say, this, this has to stop. Now, I can't do anything. I'm not a political persona. But I can certainly try, at least in the meantime, in the interim, and try and touch some of the kids who I believe deserve it and should have it. And then Muhammad introduced me to his close community. There were up to 50 kids. We were given a building, which is a, a part of the Palestinian Authority, an old school, and we could meet there every couple of weeks. Every time I could go up, I would get the kids together, and we would teach them and work music with them. As, as the years went on and everything was fine, the, uh, the 2014 Gaza operation, or war as we call it, uh, took place things got a lot worse. And whereas the, the, the threat on us was of having stones and, and uh, sticks thrown at us turned into possible bullets. So that's when Muhammad and his people around him said, you know, stop having these meetings in the camp. So we started moving him into the studio, Sabrin studio for a while. And now it's becoming even more difficult. So, you know, happy for Muhammad, I may say. And I think this has brought him some kind of notoriety. He visited the United States. He took, we did a concert in, in London, which was successful. He met a lot of great people and he's made a little career for himself. And he's got millions and millions of followers in the Arab countries. And that inhibits him and makes it a little bit more difficult. I can say almost impossible for him to continue our flow of a relationship. And so my ticket into the camp or into the kids in the camp has been basically come, has come to stop about a year ago and it's very upsetting but nothing i can do about it that's so tragic Please. um i wanted to mira's not here but i was i i mean she's just Wait. such a wonderful 
artist in, in person. And I want to go to a clip of, of a song that she created. But before I do, I just want to say one quick thing just as an introduction. She talked about a lot, I've heard her say this, she gets heat from both sides. She gets right. heat from Israelis who say you're not Israeli enough. She gets heat from Palestinians, pressure on that side mounts. She's not Palestinian enough. She's not invested enough in the narrative story of one culture versus the other. So she's in, she's between a rock and a hard place. And I just, I really admire her perseverance and doing something that should be um, so, there's nothing controversial about music. There shouldn't be, you know? And I think um, it's a shame she can't be here, but I advise everyone listening to go watch a documentary and listen to her music. She's really great. So I think Ari now has a clip that will run. So we're going to show that right now. Right. Yeah, Mira is amazing. נצא לרחובות, נבעט במוסכמות, לא נריב על מי צודק ומי אשם, אם יש פרטנר או אם אין, ומי ייתן, שגם בחשיכה הכי גדולה, נזכור להיות נר באפלה. יש בי זולם בפטש על הנורי שמה, לבדיסה מעל אלוויג'ה פס בן אלפי דמה, היו נמאס נשפט ביד אל למה, ליו אומר למייקל אחמד, יוזי וחמזה, סעד תוקר בי זה רק למה אולי וחד לבקר, אלא וואלה מחייר, איפה קורר, למה בוטה מי שידר על החייאת מסייטר, פרה סמי ג'נה חובו, ראה החל לפקר, פקר בי זה רק לאנו, בי זה רק סכן הון, כל נאם יותר וינו, כל וחד בי אילו לאון, לפרה בציר בשער עמיש על הטלוויזיון, She's, she's really wonderful. Hopefully we'll get a chance to speak with her another time. You must. Um, I wanted to, um, Steve, you're still here. So um, I wanted to ask this question uh, to you and then, and then to David. Um, a lot of people say that musicians really should stick to music. They don't have a, they shouldn't have a voice in politics. They don't have a right or even an obligation to kind of get political or talk about issues affecting people. But Steve, you really sagely say at one point, you know, I personally feel spiritually, um, you know, that I have an obligation, not everybody does. And I wanted to talk to you about, you know, why you feel that way and why you feel it's so important for you as an artist to continue spreading messages that of, um, you know, that affect society and, and society at large. Just because I can, it's, it's not <clears throat> an easy thing to do to write. Um, you know, what's essentially poetry um, ab that, about issues, it's, it's not something everyone can do. It's, it's one thing I've discovered along the way. It can be, um, it, can, it can come off incredibly um, harsh and, inc and the two things can not fit together. And I, for some reason, be, I think a lot of it is I just, it never occurred to me that you weren't supposed to do that. Right. So I'm just, I'm just old enough that it just, I, I, I don't, um, you know, I grew up on, on, you know, Bob Dylan and, you know, and Phil Oaks and the, and yeah. the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And there was stuff about issues in all of the music that I grew up listening to. Um, and uh, even the country music. So I, I, uh, because this idea, this attitude that, that, um, that artists, shouldn't uh, speak out about political issues developed. To me, it's just trying to keep from going to hell. I'm just basically been very lucky and able to make something, yeah. you know, a living doing something I love doing. So I feel like I'm obligated to put something back. And this is what I can do is lend my voice to <laughs> things that I believe in. And, and um, it's just, it, you know, it's like right now, I'm, I'm, I've got a record that's coming out that's sort of speaking to people that maybe don't didn't vote the way that I did and maybe you know uh that I it's it's about coal mining and it's about coal miners and a, and a, a disaster that 
happened 10 years ago, an explosion that happened in West Virginia. Yep. And, and the reason I'm making the record is because I've made the preaching to the choir record a couple of times. I've made Jerusalem and I made the revolution starts now, which was aimed at, you know, um, people that think exactly like I do for the most part. Um, this record's not, and, and part of it was, I, number one, I talk like this. So, uh, and everybody, everybody that, um, that lives in West Virginia, which my record is largely about, almost everybody I ran into when I started this project and started traveling around there owns a couple of records of mine that I made in the past. And so that just gave me, you know, it's, I'm doing it, be, I feel obligated to because I can, because, yeah. you know, I have a voice that maybe some people in that part of the world will listen to. And I think we're at a point in the history of this country where the things that divide us are, are causing the people that have always been very powerful to get away with a lot of stuff they've wanted to do for a long time because they've got the vast majority of the population at each other's throats arguing about this and that. I think the same thing happens in Israel as well. And, and I, to me, it's just because I can, I do, you know, so I, it's just, um, it's not, um, it, not everybody can do it. I wrote a song called John Walker's Blues years ago, and it was, it was basically me creating a character based on John Walker Lind, the, the so-called American Taliban. And, and, and it was just my perspective on it was, I woke up one day and was from CNN and I saw a 20 year old boy who looked emaciated, duct taped to a board being taken out of a, of, um, you know, what was a, a, a camp in Afghanistan. And the, the way I reacted to it was a little different than other people that I knew. The first thing that I thought was, oh, he's got parents. And the reason is I have my son, my oldest son, uh, Justin, is exactly the same age as John Walker Lind. And I, he was pretty emaciated, you know, looking most of the time, even though I know for sure he was eating. And, and I just, you know, all I could think of was my son. So I wrote that song. Uh, I remember I was traveling with Elvis Costello and, and Bobby Muller, who ran the Vietnam Veterans Foundation. We were doing these concerts for a landmine free world and we were touring Europe with it. And I told them that, I, that I, I'd been on um, Islam.com all night and I was uh, writing this song about John Walker Lind and the chorus was basically Sir of 47. And, and they said, you're crazy, do not do that. And, and, but I did it because, and I caught some flack for it but I did it because nobody else was going to do it. That, that's really basically what it boils down to. You do these things because you were given a gift and, and you get a lot from it and, and you just try to push that. And, and David, do you kind of, do you still feel that sort of like that, that pull, that obligation to, you know, create, seminate messages of love and peace or talk about social issues in the music that you create? I certainly, well, I mean, sometimes I make records because it's just, I'm interested in something musically. The last couple of records I've made have been that way. The last record I made was a record of Guy Clark songs. Guy Clark is a songwriter from yeah. Texas, my teacher, and I made a record of his songs. I made a record of Towns Van Zandt's songs, which is how David and I met. Yeah. But um, this time I was driven to make this record, which is, like I said, I thought it was time for me to start trying to understand people that don't vote the way yeah. that I did. And, 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 the, my belief is, is that we have more in common than we think we do. For instance, um, West Virginia was the most unionized place in the United States of America until very recently because of the coal mines. Now, right. a lot of people are going to give me a lot of flack because of the so-called carbon footprint of my record because it seems to some people to be pro-coal. And all it's doing is that there's songs about people that, that are third and fourth generation coal miners. Yeah. And, and they had a union that protected them. And this mine that blew up, that the, that the coal country that I wrote the songs for, Jessica Blank and Eric Jensen wrote it. And I did the songs for that. And I extrapolated that out into this album. The, 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 those people, um, they were all union members. They were all very staunchly, it was a, very much a union state because of the coal industry. This first non-union mine at Mountain, because the unions had become weaker, and the guys were suddenly working 12-hour shifts, and they weren't take, they weren't allowed the lunch break. They were paying them really good money, but all the safety inspections, all of that went away. 
play. And that's what trade unions do is protect workers. And you know what happened? They, the unions were gone and nobody to protect the guys and the mine blew up and it killed 29 miners. In this yeah, no, that, I mean, that made, that made national, international news. I remember that. I remember that yeah. clearly. I remember that's that. Um, the the I want to, if we can, if we can pivot for just a second, I think we finally have the documentary clip that we can play. Um, and cool. it's just so good. So Ari's going to play it again. And then we have some follow-up questions. So Ari, take it away. I don't have that part of me as a Palestinian. It's out. And I get confused about it. I don't come here as an Israeli saying I'm Israeli. I'm gonna find you tonight. I'm gonna count from one to three. We like to be in lines, like in camps, and to know who is with who. When somebody is not so clear, you're gonna have problems. You're this guy who does not belong to us, you know? So he's probably with them. I feel at home already. <laughs> if you just try to change, it could happen to you. What I believe in is breaking down the walls that are in your mind, that are in your heart. And those you can only do when you establish eye-to-eye -eye contact, the physical contact. I think music and art all together is the one area that humanity has where everything is open. Um, available on Amazon. You can rent it for 99 cents if anyone's interested. Um, for Steve Greenberg, I wanted to ask you a question. Did any of the Palestinian artists that appeared in the documentary and on the album, did any of them face BDS backlash from friends or family members? I think there have been some, some issues. You know, I, I know that some of the Palestinian artists who participated were very careful. They were very worried about condemnation in their community. Um, some people who participated on the album actually ended up not being in the movie because they preferred to not have their faces in the movie um, out of fear. And that, and that was a shame. You know, you, you don't that as much as people come to this project with the best of intentions and want to have communication and, and want to collaborate, they also have real life concerns and yeah. are worried. And that was a shame that that, that that happened. I know of at least one person involved in the project who I saw about a year ago when I visited Israel, who said to me that, that he thought that um, being involved in the project may have um, hindered his ability to get work in the Palestinian community subsequently. Ugh. And these are, these are real concerns. I mean, you yeah. know, I think the people who participated in this project, especially on the Palestinian side, I think were very brave people. Absolutely. And, 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 and I think we can't minimize the, um, the lengths to which they went in order to make their statement and be part of this. Mm -hmm. And and Micah, you know, for you, have you know any of the the children, the teenagers that are members of the chorus, have they faced backlash from? Oh, absolutely, members? absolutely, and they're incredibly brave. And and it and it happens on both sides. Um, I'll give you two examples. One is an example of Shifra, who's one of our singers who actually is on the East Jerusalem West Jerusalem album. She was one of our founding members, and now is on our staff. And she uh, comes from a religious uh, Orthodox family and went okay. to a religious school. And she was uh, talking to her friends in, in class about this chorus that she was in and saying it was so cool and people should come and join. And her rabbi started shouting her down and was like, you're a waste of time. Like, I can't believe you're Horrible. like, there's all this yeah. stuff. Da, 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 da. What Shifra ended up doing over the years was she actually introduced her friends from school to her choir friends, mm -hmm. just like because they were friends. And over the course of that time, by her senior project, when she was in high school, she did a photo exhibit actually about the chorus called What Gives You Hope. And she was featuring the different members and things that they had experienced. And she then wanted to invite the chorus to her school to see this photo exhibit. And again, the, the sort of head rabbi was like, absolutely not. We're not gonna have any Arabs in our school, da 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 da, da. Yeah. And ultimately Shifra's friends from school back Shifra and, and she actually created enough of a groundswell that he then caved and said, fine, they can come. It's amazing. And that was an amazing thing. So it's not just on the Palestinian side also that people really have to, you know, stand up for what they believe to do this. Um, also on the Palestinian side, um, like one of our singers, uh, also uh, Muhammad, uh, who's an amazing, amazing singer, 
Um, you know, he is still involved as one of our alumni. He's been on many videos that we've done, has lots of really amazing solos. The last song um, that we wrote with the alumni actually was about uh, something that happened to him where he was basically stopped by, uh, by an Israeli soldier and the soldier wouldn't let him go until he sang him a song. And there was just oh, wow. so much, there was so much um, sort of, just so much poignancy in that moment and, and, and so much twisting of what music is about. Um, and so we wrote a song about it. In any case, Mohammed, um, in one of our concerts uh, on our last tour at Stanford, actually, we were performing with a Middle Eastern ensemble um, that had uh, some kafiyas and he wore a kafiya as like a representation of his culture. Um, and because of what the kafia represents in Israeli culture, like Shifra actually got really upset and felt that she would maybe be threatened in her community because she was yeah. performing on stage with this guy in a kafia. And then Mohammed said, look, my dream is to be on Arab Idol and I will never be on Arab Idol because I'm in this choir. So wow. like, it's not just you who need to be worried about like what, you know, it's, it's just, that when you have two cultures that are built on zero sum narratives and both the Israeli and Palestinian cultures are fundamentally the, the fundamental narrative. Bye, Steve. Bye, Steve. Bye, Steve. Hey, yeah, I gotta go. I got an interview with them. Bye. You're amazing. Thanks, Steve. Thanks so much. You know, when you have two cultures that are fundamentally built on a zero sum way of yeah. looking at each other, you know, you're going to get right. a lot of pressure from, you know, from everybody when you try to do something that maybe makes it seem like it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. I could talk with you guys forever and I hope we get to in the future meet up, meet again and in person. Um, one last question, a fun one for David Broza, and then he's going to treat us to um, a couple of songs. Hmm. David, when this coronavirus thing is over and when people can travel again, will you ever play Masada, do you think, again? Of course. We're, okay. we're, trying to book, we're actually a uh, I'm booking Masada as we speak for October, hopefully. Okay. But I want to go back just for a second, real second, to the question you asked me, should artists really be involved yes. and get themselves involved in politics? So let me tell you, I don't think it's about a should or a would or could. It's a matter of your who you are, how the spirit. I mean, would you would you have given up on on Picasso's Guernica painting? Right. I mean, what a statement that was of the Civil War. And this is probably one of the grandest uh, pieces of art from the 20th century. And it's the same as, as far as, we're, as we go. And for example, I have a new, a new song released just recently, just last week, which is part of an instrumental album that will come out in September. It's called Tears for Barcelona. And mm -hmm. the mere, even just the title of it, Tears for Barcelona, makes you wonder, why would anybody cry for Barcelona? Yeah. There is a pain there. And it's an instrumental, not a word said. Wow. And yet I'm being asked, so why Barcelona? What's so harsh about it? And it could be about any city, you can check it out. So yeah. this is something that comes out of our soul. Not every artist wants to be part of it. I'm, I'm primarily an entertainer, trust me. Yeah. I'm interested in getting on stage and for two or three hours giving you the best time in your life. But when I walk off and I have to pay taxes and I have to do my dues and duties and everything, right. if I have something to say, the fact that I'm known, and I've, why not? Yeah. I mean, it's not, I'm not using it. It's right. part of who I am and that's it. Absolutely. So, um, okay, again, I'm gonna stop myself from asking follow-up <laughs> questions because I'm teeming with so many questions. This, let's, let's just, this will be part one. Part two, um, let's get some songs from David Broza. Okay, you want me to get you a song? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a song of choice, any, any song that you wanna sing that you feel. Well, like let's, stay, let's stay with East Jerusalem. Okay. And for example, East Jerusalem, the title song, of East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, which is the name of the project because of that song actually, is my work with Wycliffe Jean, which is kind of a, a new figure that is not appearing in the film, but he was my, my intention was to get Wycliffe Jean of the Fugees, Wycliffe Jean himself, to come and join us in the studio. He would have been great fun, along with Steve Rowe, it would have been yeah. unreal. However, he never made it to the studio, but we wrote the title song. <laughs> in the Gaza is the same face I see out in California. Same face in Jericho 
There's the same face I see down in Mexico. Same face in Tel Aviv. There's the same face I see out in New Jersey. So many faces all share the same faces. East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, Shalom, Salam. East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, Shalom, Salam. Same face on the high. It's the same face out in the bar. Same face in the blues. It's the same face out in New Orleans. Same in the blues. Same face in London town. Same face out in Houston town. So many faces all share the same faces. East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, Shalom, Salam. East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, Shalom, Salam. Feet on the sand, eyes in the sky, ears to the wall, same wondering, change ever gonna come along. Spread a little love in the morning, spread a little love. In the evening, spread a little luck before you put your head down. Maybe when you wake up, the world will be a better place. East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, Shalom, Salam. Thank you so much. All right. This is amazing. Block, block the, all the wavelengths, right? The band. Oh, it's, be it's beautiful. And I love the, the sound of, of the mix of your voice and Wyclef Jean. Is, it's, it's, so, it's so amazing. You got one more for us, maybe? All right. Well, I don't know how much time we have. So um, can we do, I think we can do one more. OK. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, maybe I, I, I won't do, maybe I won't. I mean, my, my songs tend to be very long. <laughs> well, <laughs> are so they I'll, like? <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do a compressed, uh, okay. revised version of, of Yetov, which is really the song that, yeah. that propelled me into the scene yeah. and has put me into, the, into that stage of, of politics and non-politics. When I joined Peace Now movement in 1977, 1978, Upon the arrival of uh, Egypt's president and the S Anwar Sadat, and the beginning of the peace process, and this kind of made me the singer who goes from stage to stage in every manifestation and every every event that supposedly supports the peace process. You know, and uh, 43 years later, it hasn't eased off. Um, but I'll do um, a verse of that, and then and then I cut to the chase. So this starts like this. It's called Yetov. Things will be better. Ani mabit me'achalon, v'ze ose li de'atzum. Aviv chalaf avar, mi yodea im yashu. Aleitzan haya lemen, v'mdavini aleitzan. V'shachachti l'adera, v'al ani yodka. So every year we've been adding um, verses to the song. So it's got another 40 something, 45 verses. Uh, so I'll just do one which I want to translate to everybody listening out there. And this one will say it all, so. And we shall learn to live together under the olive trees. And the children will grow up knowing no more wars, no terror. 
and no frontiers. And that fresh new grass will grow over the graveyards for love and peace. After a hundred years of war, we haven't and will not lose hope. Od nilma lichyot biyachad Ed choshot tatsehi zeiti Yeladi nilchyu bli pachad Vigvulot bli miklati a treat thank you so much that was so great thank you um we're running out of time i do i do have one last question if you can indulge me um what, you've been called the bruce springsteen of israel and for for years okay how do you feel about that comparison and could you and could you see you and bruce ever collaborating together maybe make a song together maybe do an album That's it would be good. amazing I think it's great. I mean, listen, you compare me to like the best champagne on, in, in, the, in, in, in the world. So what, is this something wrong with that? I think it's beautiful. Whether we are the same, I don't know. But we, look, one thing I do know, I have a, a producer I work with, many years, Louis Lahav, who produced with him uh, Born to Run, for example, that way back, and he's an Israeli. So that's the only common thread we have between us. The, thing, the fact that he's a human being, he touches a lot of us because he really cares about his people. He cares about the world. He cares about his country, his state. You know, he's a very touchable human being. If that, if, if we reflect a little bit off one another, great. He's a little older than me. I respect him three times more. And if, if from your words, uh, anything comes together, of course, are you kidding me? I mean, this is the greatest performer ever and one of the greatest songwriters and singers. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> amazing, amazing. What a treat. This was amazing, Ari. This was so great. I don't know if you have any Well, yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely amazing discussion. I want to thank all of you guys on the panel, Micah, Steve, David. Um, we wish Mira obviously well. Melina, yes. thank you for moderating. Please go check out the documentary if you have not watched it yet. East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. Uh, you can get on demand. Go check out the Jerusalem Youth Chorus. Uh, they just put out a new video on home. You should definitely be following them and checking them out. Go check out Mira Awad's music. I know she's been yeah. releasing a ton of new music, so make sure you go check that out. Um, we will post links to all of this on our Facebook page. And uh, while CCFP is totally apolitical, as we heard today, even when people want to keep it about music, uh, it's not always possible in that area of the world. Um, and sometimes for some artists, it's an uncomfortable position for them to be in if they don't want to be political, because um, sometimes you know the forces that be in BDS sometimes uh, force them into that area. 
So I just want to thank again Liz and Avi Kaner, along with Morton Williams Supermarkets, for sponsoring today's event. Uh, once again, Creative Community for Peace is a nonprofit organization that works to build bridges and bring people together through music while also combating anti-Semitism within the entertainment industry. So we rely on donations to do our work. So please, if you can, go donate at ccfpeace.com, ccfpeace.com or creativecommunityforpeace.com. Uh, please, you can also sign up for our email list there as we have a number of uh, great panels coming up uh, in the next few weeks. We hope everyone stays connected. We hope everybody's staying healthy and well, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. so much.